I could make this very simple, not just on you and your editors, and we could put up a list of top 10 filters, bam, 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 one to 10, right? But I wanna go through and show you why I use that filter. Yeah. Well, for sure, practice is gonna be a big thing, but there's a few little cheats that I have in here. I always think, Chris, and it's, I mean, you've got the experience, but how do you learn all this stuff? Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with Chris. Chris, great to have you back. Good to be back, David. Thanks for having me. So Chris, before we actually get into this, I just wanted to say congratulations. You just got a beautiful silver something, right? I did. I just hit 100,000 and I really want to thank you, David. You really have brought a lot of attention to my channel. I really appreciate uh, your friendship and collaboration on all of these uh, videos we've done. Yeah, so huge congratulations for hitting 100,000 subscribers. Just for everyone who's watching, Chris is gonna show us his top 10 filters right now. But I highly recommend that you go and check Chris's channel because he goes into a whole bunch of stuff that we're not gonna cover in this video and on other videos on my channel. So he has a masterclass, he has a whole bunch of other stuff. If you really wanna get into Wireshark, I highly recommend that you go and sub to his channel. Chris, you are my favorite person to talk to about Wireshark, but you know, we, we often talk about this. There's the theory and the real world. And you know, I can go through all the switches and all the options in Wireshark, but I believe you're gonna show something real world today, like the top 10 filters is it that you use in the real world? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start there, David. And one reason is because filtering can be a difficult thing to remember. I know coming yeah. on board with protocol analysis myself, that was definitely something that I hit my head against. Uh, who wants to sift through a gig trace file one packet at a time? But instead, looking for specific things quickly will help us to not just be better troubleshooters, better cybersecurity analysts, but we can do it faster. So... Let's talk about some filtering. Yeah, looking forward to this because like you say, it's it's, it's so confusing and um, it's like theory versus real world. So go for it. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and do this. All right, David. So this is actually a PCAP that we've used in one of our sessions before. This was, do you remember when we did the malware analysis? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll link that below. Okay. And the reason why I picked this one to show you some filtering is just because there's a lot, a lot of great stuff in here that's going to be fun to poke at with some filters. So first of all, let's do this. I'm going to just come in here to take a look at these packets. And one thing that we have to do a lot of times right off the bat is look for an IP address. Now, let me back up just a moment, David. I could make this very simple, not just on you and your editors, and we could put up a list of top 10 filters, bam, 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 one to 10, right? But I wanna go through and show you why I use that filter yeah. and then how it can be easily remembered, all right? So first, IP address. I mean, how often have we had to do that? I mean, I'm sure you've set one as well, right, David? Yep. Okay, so if I wanna filter on a specific IP, let's just take packet number one. Here we have two addresses. What if I wanna see all traffic coming and going from a specific address? All right, so this one on the right looks kind of fun, 5.1.81.68. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and filter on that. Now, the first thing I gotta ask myself is I, do I want all traffic going to this address or traffic coming from that address or both. Let's just say we want everything going to and from, okay? So to do that, I'm just gonna come up here, I'm gonna type in IP dot. Now this is where Wireshark, so what I'm telling it is, I want this to be an IP filter, so using the IP dissector, if you will, it's gonna be one of the IP fields. But which field? Now to do this, I'm just gonna type in IP adder, all right? So first I'm telling Wireshark what field do I want to filter for? Now, when I say adder, that's going to be either source or destination. If I wanna be specific to source or destination, one or the other, this is where I can say ip.src or ip.dst. Now, next question would be, Chris, how do you remember that? Well, if- Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So if I come up here- Do it a million times like you. Oh, well, for sure, practice is gonna be a big thing. But there's a few little cheats that I have in here because I just tell you, I don't like typing in Wireshark. It's not one of my favorite things to do. So I'm gonna come over here, gonna come down into the bottom left, which is my packet output. And if I come down here to my IP addressing, you see source, address, destination address. Now, something that's yep. very cool with Wireshark is that you have a built-in cheat sheet when it comes to the fields. So let's go ahead and have the editor zoom in with me, boom, down to the lower right. You see down here, source address, ip.source. This is gonna be pretty small, uh, but if we're zoomed in on it, it's gonna look nice and big. You can see in the parentheses there, there's a field name. So when I click on anything in Wireshark, anything at all, if that field can be filtered for, the syntax for identifying that filter 
is going to be in that little parentheses. So there's a, there's your first thing with Wireshark. All of this memorization you have to do with the syntax and remembering the dots and the slashes and all the things, right there we have a cheat sheet for field name. So if I forget ip.source, just go to the source address field of IP, and then down here on the little right, ip.source. Same with destination, ip.destination. Now if it's either one, what I do, and this is just me, this is what my eyes have gotten used to doing. Usually it's something that's simple to remember, like for example, ADDR, right? A part of the address. So that's where it's something that we can just get used to, ADDR. And that will let us do either one. So I'm gonna do equals equals, I'm gonna do 5.1.81.68. And boom, there's my address filter for that single IP. If I take a peek, my eyes just automatically, it just does it, David. I'm just walking you through what I'm looking at right now. If I come down here to displayed, you can see the number of packets that I have is 12,953, but of that 12,953, uh, 683 are displayed. Okay, let's back up. So there's a simple address filter. Now to me already that was too much typing. So now I'm gonna show you, you can type <laughs> in a filter or just drag and drop is a lot easier. Okay, if I come up here to the top, I just remove that filter. So now what I can do is, and this is the real world stuff. This is actually what I really do, David. I don't type in IPs because first of all, I, I just don't want to, I'm lazy. Say it, it's fine. Um, if I come up here to, any of these fields, if you look at the top up here, this whole top like packet list area, if you think about it almost like an Excel spreadsheet, each one of these little cells has a piece of data in it in a certain yeah. category. So for example, here, here's an IP address, 5.1.81.68. That is in the destination column. So what I can do is I can just take this IP, drag, I'm literally clicking it right now. I just drag it and drop it up top. And That's nice. because that was the destination, now it automatically will set the filter for me. So now uh, all I gotta do is go, you know what? I didn't want destination. I wanted everything. So now I have both ways. So that's a faster way to set a filter. If you could just find it in your PCAP, drag it upstairs and either fix the filter or fix the destination or source, depending on what you're going for, that's a quick way to set a filter for an IP address. That's great. And it's IP because it's not IPv6, right? That You'd have to type IPv6 for, on the, if, cause this is IPv4, right? Exactly, yes. Um, now for me, here's what I do with V6, just because that can be, talk about a lot of typing. Usually if I'm looking for a V6 thing, which I think in this PCAP, I don't, I don't have any IPv6. No, I don't, David, so I can't demo it, but what I do is I'll really look for that address. What I'll first do is just do IP.V, sorry, V6, and then I'll find whatever packets match it, and then I can come down and look for the address I'm looking for, and that's where I really use my drag and drop because come on, who wants to type all that out? And one other little cheat that I do is I'll come up to statistics endpoints. Yep. And what this does is it allows me to see all the addresses. And from here, instead of scrolling and scrolling and looking, I can go, ooh, that's the one I'm interested in. I click it, right click, apply as filter, selected. Oh. So from the statistical view, this is where I can also select an address. It'll pop me back into the analyzer and it'll give me both directions for that one IP. That's also really useful because if I come up here to stats again, let's go back to endpoints. To CV6, I might have to activate that field here. Right now mine was deactivated, but if I do have V6, I can come over here. I can look at all of the entries here in a list and I can right click and I can filter for the one I'm interested in. I always like to ask you the real world stuff because you're doing this all the time and companies send you these PCAPs all the time. Do you see a lot of IPv6 or is it still mainly IPv4? That's a great question. And I think the word that I would use is I'm seeing more IPv6. Uh, okay. I, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's something that, um, you know, compared to 10 years ago, it's definitely something that's growing. However, still seeing a whole lot of v4. But most of your troubleshooting is IPv4 stuff. I would say today it's still mostly before, yes, I'd say that's an accurate that's statement. All right, David, let's back up and recap. My first filter that I use constantly all the time is an IP address filter. Let's do another one. I'm just gonna modify this just a little bit, okay? Let's just say that this is filter number two, even though it's kind of connected to filter number one, and that's a subnet filter. So the nice thing about an address here, I just spelled out the whole thing, but if I want to, I can just take out as many octets as if I want to, 
and I can just pop in a zero and then I can just give it the number of bits in the subnet mask. What that'll do is it'll set a subnet filter and it'll allow me to filter for a range of addresses or that are within a specific subnet. I can get pretty specific with it. I can get into like down to, I wanna see from this address to this address, this first 10 addresses in a certain subnet, but oftentimes, most of the time, practically real world, a subnet filter will do the trick. So like slash 24, slash 16 or something, right? 100%, yeah. Usually that's, that's what I'm doing. That's great. So all you did was change the octet from whatever value it was to like zero, the last octet, and then make it slash 24. You got it. That's great. Now, for everybody out there that doesn't want to remember what I just said, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to come over here to this little plus button. You see that little plus button there? Let, yep. Let's click that. And what we're going to do is just call it subnet filter. Subnet filter. Okay. And although you will probably change the IPs as you grow in your analysis. I'm just gonna say, okay, and now I have on the top right over here, I've got this subnet filter button. So now when I come back to Wireshark next time, if I just wanna set a subnet filter, I can just click that and then I can change the variables, change the addresses, and I don't have to remember how to set that. So that's nice. saving filter buttons, that's another little mini tip that I'll give you. So let's recap, David. We first did a specific address and then we learned how to filter for a subnet. Now another very common one that I get asked about or one that I set myself is for a port number, be it yeah. UDP, TCP, or a range. So I'm gonna show you, there's two aspects of this next filter that I'm gonna show you. One is a specific port, and the next is one of ports on a list. Whether the port is this or this or this or this, go ahead and display it. Well, let me back up, I'm going to just remove this and I'm gonna show you the why factor. So a lot of times I'm doing TCP analysis, that's the why, uh, and ports are a big deal. So just like it sounds, tcp.port equals, got my double equals, and this is where the this operator makes a difference. So before I dig any deeper into these weeds, first I just wanna talk for a moment about these operators that you see here. So there's several different operators that I can use. One is the equals here. So if I'm saying, hey, this field, compare it to this value, well, and then show if true, then I use equals equals. I also could use the English expression of EQ. It does exactly the same thing, all right? Both will turn Wireshark green. When you get your filter syntax right, you see that Wireshark filter turns green. When it's wrong or when it's got something missing, it'll warn you by giving you that red display filter bar. Okay, so tcp.port EQ is the same as equals equals. What else can we use here? We can also use uh, is not equal to. So show me all the stuff that's not port 80. Uh, what else, what else? Uh, there's a few other operators. Like for example, I could say, I can also use maybe an or or an and operator when I'm looking at different values. I'm gonna progressively be showing you how to use those. But for now, let's just do equals equals. And I'm going to go ahead and type in 80. Show me all the port 80 traffic. Well, as you and I know, port 80 is kind of disappearing <laughs> from a lot of things. Yeah. Now, a lot of things are going over secure web. They're going to go over to port 443. So let's say that I wanted to see either port 80 or 443. Well, I could say port 80 or back out 443, sure. But how could I see one or the other? Well, there's a couple ways I can do that. One, I could say TCP port equals equals 80 or TCP dot port equals equals 443, right? Now, as we know, some uh, web servers use more than port, just port 80. They might use, or even uh, secure web servers, they might do 4443 or 8000, 8001, 8002. So I could just make a big list of ORs. How do you like that, David? Does that look efficient? Uh, not if I know you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I can just, you know, completely burn myself out putting in all the port numbers. Or what I can do, let me just back this up. Anytime that I'm using the same field name, right, over and over again, port, port, port. What I can do now is I'm gonna show you the next coolest filter ever in the world. <laughs> okay, so TCP port, and I just I just use in, the in operator. Hey David, have you ever heard of the in operator before? Uh, no, tell us about it, Chris. Let's do it. So this is the membership operator. And what this does is it allows me to use a curly brace and then I can give a bunch of different values here that can be used as basically or statements in a way. So tcp.port in membership operator, I think about it like includes <laughs> or could include. That's nice, yeah. Yeah. 80, yeah. 
comma, you got to be comma separated, 8443 comma 8000. And then here's a cool thing. Dot, dot makes it a range, 8005 curly brace. That's nice. So what I just That's specified nice. is show me any packet that has a port that is 80, 443, 8000, 8000, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And I did that all with one expression. I always think, Kristen, it's, I mean, you've got the experience, but how do you learn all this stuff? Just like check the reference guides, watch your videos on your YouTube channel. How do I learn this stuff? You know what? That's a very good question, David. And that's where I want to give some props to some other analysts in the, in the industry. There's a, a friend of mine named Jasper and Saka. There's these two amazing um, people in the Wireshark community. You can find them. In fact, Saka, if you go to Wireshark About, you'll find his name in the authors, right? S-A-K-E. Nice. So these these guys, uh, they're friends of mine. They're amazing analysts. And by observing some of their workflows, what I've done is I've gone, whoa, I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> I could do this better. So a lot of times going to an industry conference like SharkFest or in having conversations with these ones through various means, um, that's where I can say, hey, I need to set a certain type of filter. David, you asked how I learned some of these things. I just mentioned some of the industry experts, but here there's another area that I'd like to take a look. Uh, and this is yep. ask.wireshark.org. You can get here if you just go to the wireshark.org homepage. And then at the top, I believe you just go to uh, ask a question and it'll bring you here. Or if you could just bookmark ask.wireshark.org. Uh, this is where people, when they got questions about Wireshark, packet analysis, how to set a filter, all the stuff. This is just a monster wiki. And the awesome thing about it is that some of the people that are answering these questions, like Yap, he's a core developer. This, this is one of the developers that is actually writing this thing. You know, if you look at some of the others, Christian R., if you look at Chuck C., he's an he's awesome guy. I mean, Sinbit, that's that's the one that I just showed you, Sokka. So these people are actively answering questions out on ask.wireshark.org. Fantastic community. And if you have a question that, or a, maybe a protocol or a filter you'd like to set, not sure how to do it, you can either search for it, see if it's been covered, or go ahead and register and ask it. And you're probably going to get help from one of the core developers. Great question, David, and thanks for asking it. Okay, so where were we? We already set a IP address. We did source and destination. I showed you how to look at those filter names. Uh, we went and saved the filter, and we went ahead and looked at how we can set a range of ports using the membership operator. So I think that's three filters. Is that right, David? Yep, yep. So another one that I'm going to set, this is the fourth display filter that I use. I would say this one's just as common as the rest, and that is a TCP conversation filter. So not just a port number. I want to see the actual conversation between these two endpoints using this port. Yep. Now to manually set that, I would have to say IP adder IP and IP adder IP. So I would set the IP address to those two IPs and it would give me the conversation between those two ad addresses. Yep. And then I also would need to include the port numbers. So TCP port equals equals XYZ and TCP port equals XYZ. It's really manual though, right? So one way that I do this, I'm just going to give you the real deep dive practical. If I come up here to statistics, going to go to conversations and I'm going to bring up TCP. Basically, one thing that I like to do is I like to look for a conversation that I'm digging for. So maybe if I just, I'm just going to sort on port B. I know in this PCAP, there's an interesting conversation like here on port 447. That's only because I've seen this PCAP several times. That's going to catch my eye. If I right click on that guy, right click, apply as filter, selected. And I'm just going to drop down here to filter A to B, B to A. And I'll show you why in just a moment. So I just set a filter there. I hit, I clicked it, close. And if I come up here, you can see all the parameters that are needed to set a conversation nice. filter, right? So like I said, it's got to be IP adder address A and TCP port port A and <laughs> IP adder address B and TCP port B, right? So all of those things need to exist in order for a packet to be displayed and I said source or destination, so it could be at or in either direction. Now that's one way that I do that. Let me show you another. Something that I see a lot of people do, I'm just gonna jump back up to the top, is when they wanna filter on a conversation, what they'll do is they'll right click it and they'll go follow TCP stream and- Yeah, a lot of people do that, yeah. Yeah, and you know what? There's there's nothing wrong with this, but watch what I do. Follow TCP. Okay, I'm looking around, that the London sounds dodgy. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Just had to throw that in. You know, if I, I'm looking here, but but this is encrypted. So likely the next thing I'm going to do, David, is come over here and hit close. So now I've filtered on a stream, but 
I'm not filtering on the conversation per se. Well, I, I am, it is the conversation, but the first thing I did is I ripped out the stream data that is encrypted and put it on a screen that I'm gonna close. Okay, so let's look at a better way to do that. If I right click packet one, conversation filter TCP, this is the better way to do it. So now That's nice, yeah. I'm not gonna go and yep. have that stream data that I just closed. If I'm filtering on the TCP conversation, then I can come right here. And you notice here, I think, I thought this was interesting when I first saw it. Um, you notice that the conversation, the TCP conversation syntax is a little different here than it was a minute ago when I came from statistics. That's because different people wrote those different things. That's interesting. So there's nothing wrong with either one. They both accomplish the same thing. Here, I've got a parenthesis around the two IPs and a parenthesis around the two port numbers. I just as easily could have said address and... TCP port and address and TCP port like it came over before. So you'll see this as you continue to use Wireshark. There's not just one singular way to do something. Sometimes there's more than one way and your way is the best way. It's the one that makes the most sense to you with the logic of the filter. Call the tomato, right? Yeah. And aluminium. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good example. Come on, you, you've got to say it the way you say it. Uh, you mean aluminum? That's right, yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's tomato? Yes, Chris. Let's practice, David. Because, you, because you're the Wireshark guru, I'm going to agree with you, correct? Let's, okay, we're going to practice, everyone. Let's all say it with David. Tomato. <laughs> tomato, yeah. Okay, we'll go with that. Okay, so <laughs> same package. Sorry for the sidetrack, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's the same result. I always, I always laugh when people get upset about stuff like that because it's, you know, do it the way, like I love the way you said it, do it the way that works for you. Yeah, exactly. And well, because this comes from, and I'd like to share this with you in the audience is because this comes from being asked in front of a lot of people and a lot of different audiences and, and experiences being in, with, in classroom settings. Hey, Chris, what is the right way? Yeah, exactly. And I say, well, what is, this is a way. And now if you find a better way for you, use it. You might think that my way is the craziest way in the universe and it makes no sense to you. I've been told worse in my life. And, you know, as, as long as we're getting to the right packets, that's all that matters. Okay, so next, filter five. One that I use quite a bit is when I'm analyzing something and I want to see more than one protocol. So this is a simple one. Let's just say that I want to see all TCP as well as all DNS because a system might be sending out a DNS request and then establishing a TCP connection. And I want to see both of those protocols. So that's a simpler one, TCP or DNS. Both of those protocols. Glad you're doing that. I'm glad you didn't do TCP or UDP because it's different layers, right? So that's good to see. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not just talking any UDP. I specifically want to see DNS. Now, um, with that said, you know, sometimes people go, I want to see TCP and DNS. Now, unless DNS is running over TCP, which it can, but many cases we use DNS over UDP. Uh, that's why this isn't going to have any results because I was too specific with my filter and there aren't any packets that are both TCP and DNS. That's what I'm saying. The logic that I work through here is to display a packet, it has to match TCP and DNS display. So that's why the filter doesn't net anything for me. So in this case, or is the better operator. Okay, so that was filter number five. But I love what you're doing, Chris, because you know, like we said, and I don't want to reiterate too much, but it's what I love about these interviews with you is you do this stuff all the time in real world troubleshooting, analysis, you know, finding dodgy traffic and you distilling the stuff that you actually use day to day. Yeah, absolutely. This is not just some list I read off a book. In, yeah, exactly. in fact, I found these lists in some books. So I kind of wonder if people are listening, which is great. Hey, use it. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, next is when I'm looking for a word. I mean, sometimes I'm just looking for a string in a packet. I know a lot of things are are encrypted, right? Like they're running over TLS over, over TCP, so they're encrypted. However, sometimes you still get a word or two in there. Like for example, the one that we just saw, London. So yeah. if I wanna go hunting for a word, this is another common one. Now this is where I first specify where or what protocol do I want Wireshark to begin looking at, right? So I could just say IP, or I could say TCP, or I could say UDP, or I could say DNS, or I could say HTTP. Right? So what protocol do I want to start with? I'm going to begin with, you know, IP. Now that's IPv4 when I don't spe uh, specify that. So I'm just going to say IP and now when I'm looking for a string, typically I'm either using contains and then I spell out the string or let's see if that matched anything. It sure did. Or what I can do if I, you see how London is capital up here? 
Yeah. So right now I've got 26 packets that match. So instead I can use the, the regular expression operator and that's matches. And what that does is it allows London to be any case. That just made it case insensitive, nice. yeah. okay? So this is a common one that I use by habit. What I'll do is instead of IP, TCP, or otherwise, I just do ETH matches. So now anything that is basically in this PCAP, anything that's encapsulated or wrapped in Ethernet, I don't care if it's TCP, UDP, HTTP, picket, or in this case, TLS. The reason why this is showing is because a lot of times the server identifier is going to be clear text. So that's where we'll see, or the certificate, sometimes you'll see some info in there. Uh, but the, at least that's where I'll, I'll find that word. Uh, that I might be looking for. And like most traffic, if not all traffic you see today is Ethernet, right? All that old dodgy stuff is long gone? Almost all. I mean, I don't often see non-Ethernet. Sometimes in Wi-Fi environments, that's kind of another conversation, but uh, usually most of the time you're getting Ethernet too. Chris, a question, I think we've discussed this previously, is like, how do I get rid of stuff that I don't want to see? Because, you know, there's so much stuff out there on the network and it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack type thing. Yeah, so how do I kind of get rid of things but leave the rest? Yes. Oh, that's a great question, David. One that I use practically a lot. And let's go ahead and get that into the next filter, which I'm sorry, everyone, if I'm wrong on this. I could be, but I think we're on six. I believe so. If I'm wrong, hey, hit me up in the comments and tell me that I don't know how to count. I'm fine with that. <laughs> or you just got 11 out of me. I'm fine with that too. Okay, uh, so let's come up. So I, I call this the like get rid of background chatter uh, filter. Yeah. And what this means is that sometimes there's filters or there's protocols or conversations that just make it staticky and murky and they get in your way, right? Like, for example, if you just sent me a full PCAP off of a network, a lot of times there's broadcasts running around, there's ARPs running around, there's STP running around, layer two stuff. Uh, so uh, CDP, LDP, not that that stuff is never useful. Of course, there's times when... ARP is useful. Of course, there's times when STP, spanning tree, no question. However, sometimes it just gets in my way. So this is what I do. I like to do a not open parenthesis. And this is where I can say, get rid of the ARPs, or uh, this is where I can say STP, or LLDP, or CDP, or eth.adder equals equals ff.ff, because I got to use a MAC address here. That's a broadcast. So let me be very specific again. It's not that I'm saying those things are never useful. Of course they are, but sometimes they get in my way. So I just scrape all those out. And from here, I can just keep going. What if I say, or TCP dot port in squiggly. And if I do a uh, 443, for example, just cause I'm looking at this conversation, let's just say, let's just get rid of all that stuff and then just do a close print. Okay, so I just got rid of that conversation. Let me come over here. I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna start scraping away things. DNS or TCP port. And 443, I'm gonna do a comma 80 because that's just the next thing I physically see. Now check that out. Right away, you see by scraping stuff off, the weird can rise to the top. So especially when you're threat hunting, this is the yeah. type of thing that's super useful. Get rid of what you know. Even though it's possible they can be hiding in plain sight using um, 443 to run command control traffic, that's absolutely 100% possible. But if I'm ever looking for weird protocols that I shouldn't see, this is a way to get rid of the ones that I, I know that I typically do see. So here's a 447. How do you like that one, David? Yeah, Chris, that's fantastic. Would you ever like scrape out all this stuff and then save that PCAP as a new PCAP and then take that PCAP that's been filtered and then search for specific things? Or would you like in that same filter, remove stuff and then look for other things? Yes, I would. So especially if you sent me, a lot of times I'm working with clients and they send me very large PCAPs. So one of the first things I wanna do is reduce them. So what I'll do is I'll throw a filter like this at it, get rid of the stuff I don't want to see and then save whatever's left over. Now to do that, don't go file save as. That's not gonna work. All you're doing is saving this file again maybe as another name, yep. but all the same packets. What you gotta do, export specified, okay? So if I come down here, let's go ahead and focus down here on the bottom. This is where I can give it a file name, David. And then I can come down here and say, give me all packets that are displayed. Awesome. Or I can say all packets within a range. Show me the displayed ones, but only show me 100 to 1000. 
that's only going to save 901 packets. All right, so that's something I do. That'll scrape out what I see or the ones that I select into a new PCAP. And then I close this one, open up the new one. And now I have a much smaller data set to work through. What's the biggest PCAP you've ever received in size? Of like how many gigs? I got a... 30 gig before. Goodness. I think that was the that's largest terrible. one. Yeah. And I had to use. Yeah. I mean, that's insane, right? Yeah. I had to use command line tools to chop it up first. Cause if you try to open up something like that in Wireshark, either it'll choke or it'll take a very, 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 very long time. Wireshark's not designed to handle packet captures efficiently at that size. One reason is because it's doing so many analytics under the hood for all of these packet captures or for all these packets. I mean I mean, 30 gig of text is insane. Oh, come on. Yeah, <laughs> no one wants that. So a lot of times uh, for that, David, I'll, I'll go to the command line tools, which, hey, you know what? Maybe coming to a future Bombal video near, near you is we'll, we'll show how to slice and dice large PCAPs with uh, T-Shark. Yeah, I'm glad you sh you're showing this because it's like, okay, it's great to have this filter where you've got the noise, but the real world implementation of that is you manage to get this crazy large file, all the large files that people send you and you get it to the core stuff that you're looking for. And honestly, David, it also comes down to the way it's captured from the get-go. What I try to do with my clients yeah. is capture so that you fill up a PCAP and you stop and start the next one. So you don't ever get to super large PCAPs. You're capturing so that they never cap out more than a gig, right? Okay. Right. So that I was going to ask you what's a good size. So a gig's good size, right? Yeah, I mean, a gig or less is what I, I shoot for. So maybe we can either in the comments down below or uh, link up above. There's a video that I have on my YouTube channel about how to set that up. So that'd be great. Yeah. And it's how to capture in smaller chunks just to make the work easier for you on the analysis end. Yeah, I'll link that below. That's brilliant. Okay. Filter seven. We ready? I think we're there. Yeah. I think it's seven now. Yeah. All right. Another one that I use a lot is going to be, and this is number seven. Wait, I just showed you six, seven. All right. Uh, let's go to tcp.analysis.flags. There's a one that I use. And the reason is that, so basically Wireshark, one of the things that it does, and one of the reasons why it takes a long time to open up a PCAP that's super huge is it's doing analytics and looking for stuff in PCAPs. One thing is for TCP flags. So anytime you have TCP act unseen segment, retransmissions, fast retransmissions, spurious retransmission, out of order, zero window, anything that is TCP interestingness, even if it's not necessarily broken, but maybe something that should merit attention, uh, this is a, a filter that I use. In fact, to be very honest, what I'll do is a lot of times window updates, unless I'm doing throughput analysis, those are things that I can disregard. I'm not super worried about them. So what I might do is just say TCP analysis flag, show me that and not. And if I, I'm totally going to forget the syntax, so I'm going to show you how I get it. I, I do not want to show window updates. So let me go ahead and expand TCP. And I'm going to come down to, you see where it's the, it, the blue down here, sequence acknowledgement analysis. It's showing me, yep. hey, Chris, there's stuff here. Wireshark found some interesting things. If I expand this out, it's just showing me that, hey, this is just a window update. I can take a look down below and I can see what the syntax is. TCP.analysis.window underscore update. Way too much to cop to type out. So if I just drag this upstairs and I say, uh, I'm going to unclick and now it's going to ask me a question. Hey, Chris, do you want to replace what you have with this? Or do you want to append this to what you have? So this is where I'm going to say, and not now it's going to fuss at me at start. Cause I got a double knot in there and, and oh, oops, I took out the wrong knot and not when to update. Hang on. Oh, <laughs> Okay, I gotta fix this a little bit because I already did some of the work for me. So I have to take out the and not because it basically did a double and not. So sorry, everybody. If you just did tcp.analysis.flags and then you drug this up and said and not, that's to be the easiest way. That's so now show me all the flags, but do not show me the window updates. Now just show me the brokens. Uh, black lines with red letters, the retransmissions, the bad things. The reason why these are going to catch my attention is because I don't want to see a whole lot of retransmissions if I can help it. I don't want to see a lot of out of orders and dupe acts and troubleshooting network layer issues. So a lot of times when I see these kinds of events, that's telling me that I'm getting packet loss somewhere. In this PCAP, I don't see a lot of them. I only see what, a whopping five packets that met that filter. I'm not going to worry too much about it. But imagine, David, what if I saw a thousand of these? Yeah. That's where I'm going to go, hmm, between what two systems do I see a lot of retransmissions? Hmm, that's between me and my server. Hmm, that application's slow. Maybe the network's dropping traffic. All right, are you ready for eight? Yeah, that'd be great. 
All right, so there's other really interesting filters or, or fields, I should say, that Wireshark does for us. Let me jump to the top again. All right, and these are called time filters. Now there's, this is automatically done by default with Wireshark. We just gotta know where to look. So an easy one to demonstrate this with, I'm gonna do it with two things. One is a TCP time filter and the other is DNS. Let's actually start with DNS because that's the easier one. So I'm just gonna have everybody just filter on DNS, bam. Now this is all the DNS requests and replies in the PCAP. Now, automatically, Wireshark, if I click on that first packet, you see over here on the left of the screen, I've got two little arrows. This indicates yeah. what is the request and what is the reply. Now, if I click the reply, and if I come down here digging, if I go down into DNS, and if I come down to below answers, I can see time. Now, if I click on this, notice down below, it says DNS.time. So Wireshark automatically measures the amount of time between a DNS request and a response. So all I gotta do is, let's just do this. I'm just gonna right, I'm actually gonna drag and drop. Okay, I'm gonna apply that as a selected filter. So dns.time equals equals, then I've got the actual value for this specific call, but let's do this. What if I back up, instead of dns time equals equals, what if I do dns time is greater than zero dot, uh, let's just say that was 46 mil, 48048. So let's just do zero one zero. So what this does is it shows me, show me all packets with DNS time that is greater than 10 milliseconds. That's nice. In other words, you're looking for slow DNS responses, right? That is correct. That's nice. So right here, what I did is I just right clicked it. I kind of did this while you were talking, David. I right clicked apply as column for DNS.time. And then I can come up here and you notice now that I've got a time column, this measures DNS response time. And I can sort, nice. I can sort that. So now I know the slowest DNS response that I had in this entire PCAP was 257 milliseconds. So now t 10 seconds is pretty quick. So let's actually make this a little bit better. I'm just gonna do dot two. So two milliseconds. So now show me any responses that are slower than two, I'm sorry, not two milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. And this is something that you bet we can add. I'm gonna hit plus. I'm gonna say slow DNS. And I'm gonna say, okay. And now I've got another button over here, slow DNS. And I can change that value. Do I, do I want it to be half a second? Do I want it to be a full second? So now as I'm going through PCAPs, now I can just start looking for slow DNS time. Now this is fuel for another conversation, David. This is also a value that we can graph out so we can see how DNS is performing over time from right within Wireshark. We'll do that another time though. How often is DNS the problem, Chris, in your experience? Is this saying that it's always DNS, right? I know, I know the saying is it's always DNS, but I hear, you know, I'm usually the defender of many different silos, right? It's always the network, it's always <laughs> DNS, it's always the firewall, yep. it's always the, so I'm usually the defender of the always the guy or girl. Uh, so uh, DNS can be a component. Yeah. Is that an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you're saying it's not something that's, it's not always the problem, it's many other things as well. Absolutely. I mean, it can be something else, but I will say this, you're, you're in trouble if DNS is the problem. Like that's usually, and symptomatically what I'll listen for is it's slow to connect to an application and not just one application, multiple applications. Uh, things are laggy and weird. Uh, DNS health is something I definitely want to check for first. Like take, for example, this slow DNS. Let's just take this as an example, David. If I come here to slow DNS and I get no hits on DNS.time is greater than 200 milliseconds. Now I know DNS is fine or it, from a performance perspective. And now I might wanna do some errors, go looking for some DNS error level things. Or what I also could do is just say name. I can start to take a look if I apply this as a column, start looking through the names that are coming back as responses and see if I have any strangeness there as well. You said earlier, if you have a DNS problem, that's, uh, that's an indication that there's some other major problem, right? Uh, if DNS is broken, then we have a problem. So that's why DNS health, that'll be something yeah. that I validate usually right off the jump. And my eyes do it quickly, David. I mean, let me show you what in real world, real talk, this is what yep. I do if I just remove my filter because we were already into the weeds a little bit. Let me jump back up to the top. So right here, what I do is I, I look through and I go, hmm, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes. Ooh, DNS, ooh, response, 48 milliseconds. Okay, that's not why you called me unless that response is wrong or busted in some way. But usually if it's performance, things worked, but just not quickly, 
usually my eyes will go 48 milliseconds. That's not why David called me for this little 48 milliseconds. Let's go hunting for why he called me. Now time, we're still on time. Okay, so let's go on to the next filter that this is not filter number nine. This is actually 8.5, so this is a bonus filter. So I talked to you about there's different time filters. One of the thing that I, I like to show you is a handshake filter or a TCP time okay. filter is one of them. So if I come up here to packet number one, you see packet number two is coming back and you see my delta time is 134 milliseconds. Now, we in previous videos, maybe we can link below, uh, we talked about how to set up the delta time. Or if you wanna see another video about it, I got one on my YouTube channel, the uh, Wireshark Masterclass Lesson One. So if you stop into my channel, you'll find it there. So go check it out. It's how to set this up. How to, some of the coloring rules that you see, how my TCPs are green. I've got a Delta Time filter here. You see all these buttons and all these different profiles. How to do all of that, just go check out that video and uh, you can see some of the setup. So for purposes of time, That's right, yeah. I'll just leave this here. So sin and sin at comes back 134 milliseconds. This is now a, a, a measurement that I can take a look at in Wireshark. What Wireshark does is it adds up the delta time between the sin and sin ac, and then the final sin ac and ac. The three packets of the three-way handshake, this gets added together. So 134,995. This is now something that Wireshark calls IRTT, initial round trip time. So let's go hunt for that number. Now it's gonna be down in TCP, and this is sequence acknowledgement analysis, and you see IRTT here, same value, and we can see where it comes from. It's the delta between the sin, sin ac, and the sin ac in the first ac. So now IRTT, so now this is something, I'm just going to right click for a moment and add it as a column, and I'm going to remove this delta time, or the, this DNS one. And if you notice, that same value is used for all packets that are a part of that conversation because there's only one IRTT per TCP conversation. So it's not a super useful IRTT thing if I'm just glancing through one conversation, but as soon as conversations start to fly, then what I can do is I can sort this. And if I just go up, oh, that's going, I'm just gonna jump down to the bottom now. So the most time that I have the largest IRTT, these are one-offs down here. I'll talk about those in a minute. But the largest IRTT that I have is 616 milliseconds between two endpoints. That was in the handshake. So let's actually investigate that. Right click, conversation filter, TCP, and then I'm gonna click number to put my packets back in order. So right here, David, what we just found is, look at that, a 616 millisecond network round trip time between these two endpoints. Yeah, Does that sound good? Only if you like in, on Mars, maybe. <laughs> right, exactly. That doesn't make me too happy. So I've got some delay here. Now, um, if I take a look, just so you know, on this profile, I also have something called called GOIP enabled. So if I come up to IP, I can see that this uh, source IP address is in Indonesia. So if, yeah. if my client is, let's just say in the UK, and this server is in Indonesia, well, then you know, okay, <laughs> I'm going quite a distance between these two endpoints, or maybe I'm not properly connecting to the server that I should be that is more local to me in my environment, or maybe my yeah. CDN isn't sending me to the right place. Yeah, I mean, in other words, I mean, the thing you've highlighted that, but it could be like that they're not using Cloudflare or CDN, like you mentioned, or I mean, that could be normal, right? In certain parts of the world. Could be, or as you know, this uh, PCAP is named malware analysis. So this client is actually well, initiating a connection to somewhere over in Indonesia and is that, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. Yeah. Okay, so that, yeah. that's something that might be interesting. That leads us to filter number nine. But before I get to filter number nine, the next question for users is, wait, my Wireshark doesn't have destination GOIP. How do I get all that, Chris? How can I see city, exactly. country, and then even uh, latitude, longitude? Well, we're gonna link another video down below because I actually have how to find IP addresses geographically and map them. And uh, we did that together, David, but maybe a shorter yep. way to do it, to give everybody just a link. Um, th they'll also meet my cat. He walks across the table in that video. So nice. very, nice. yeah, cool. gotta meet Pepe. Yeah, so you can go ahead and um, link that below, but that's just a five minute quick how to set that up in Wireshark. Okay, David, that actually brings me to my next filter that I have for you. And that's when I'm filtering on a country code. So you just notice that I have my GYP filtering here. So something yep. that I might do is come down here like source or destination GYP two letter country code and is this one's Germany, for example, that's the country code. So if I take this, I'm just gonna drag it upstairs and this is where I can say, show me anything to and from that country code. Now, can that be spoofed? Yes. 
Do I absolutely know that this is coming from Germany? No. However, does it give me just a ballpark possible? Uh, that looks a little weird type of thing. Absolutely. Or maybe I want to come up here and I just want to say something like UK. I think in this, you know, let's pick on those UK guys. And let's just say I do not want to see anything coming to and from UK. Show me, show me everything else. So if I have a system that should be contained within, you know, IPs that I know should be coming from my environment or from thereabouts, show me everything that is not. So that can be an interesting filter that of course requires the GOIP databases, but once we have those there, uh, we can use those to our advantage, especially when threat hunting. And in the real world, that's helped you, eh? Oh, absolutely, yeah. In fact, I have a profile. One of my profiles is my security profile. And if I bring that one up, my security profile, and one of the things that I have is countries and then just some of the country codes that I look for that typically might raise a flag when I'm threat hunting. Thing is, Chris, you know, in th there's a theoretical part of it that we can debate. And then there's what you actually do on the ground. And that's what's, you know, it's nice to ask you those questions and you just give us your experience. I mean, experience varies, but it's great to hear what you do. For sure. Well, and you can see right here, you notice that even some of my coloring codes, when I switched over to this profile, which again, yeah. you can learn from lesson one of my Wireshark Masterclass, go check it out. But basically what this does is it makes those things jump out a little different. You notice that this client hello is now yeah. red or yeah. uh, now the response, this DNS response is now orange. So here I can see that I've added some things like this one is if you open up the frame information, DNS.count.answers are greater than five. Hmm. So I've got a DNS reply that's larger than five responses, which might look a little sketchy. That's a little sus as they say. Yeah. So might want to go digging into that and make sure that's okay. All right. So that was number nine. All right, David, we've come to the end. The last number 10, most used Wireshark filter packet head certified. Any idea what it's about? Um, no, tell us. Okay, good. one that I do a lot is tcp.flags.reset equals equals one, that the reset field is set. Now reset, this is an abortive release. This is when one side or the other of a TCP connection says, bye, talk to the hand, I'm done. So if this happens after a conversation has finished, no big deal. Well, that could be just how the system is shutting down the connection. Might not be pretty, but you got to hang up the phone eventually anyways. But the problem is, what if this happens at the beginning of a connection? Or what if during midstream, I ask you for something, David, you start sending it to me, and then boom, I just send you a reset out of nowhere. Or you send me a reset in the middle out of nowhere. That's also suspect. A little sus. So uh, resets are something that I find myself analyzing, especially when we have disconnections applications that suddenly disappear or maybe never establish in the first place. Maybe we're sending sins and getting resets back. Uh, somewhere else I'll look for resets is if I have a large number of them, and it could be that we're those are coming from ports that are closed. So say, for example, I'm just going to pick on an IoT device. What if I see an IoT device kicking off a ton of resets, but it's also getting a bunch of sin activity to ports it's not supporting? So that's weird. Like, who's talking to it? Why are, is it getting scanned? Do I see an yeah. Nmap signature? Do I, see, I mean, Nmap is going to generate a bunch of resets. That's because it's sending sins and resets are coming back. So where are they coming back from and why are they there? So this is, I would say, pretty safely that this belongs on the top 10 list of Wireshark filters that I use most often. This is brilliant, Chris. I mean, like we were, you said earlier, something, you know, people can read it a book. And some books actually use your list, it sounds like. But this is real world stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. And I and I can't say that definitively. But yeah, I've seen some similar lists out there. But you know what, though? <laughs> These are the common filters, right? These are ones that I use. And I think my intent here was to show people not just what they are, but why I use them and how they yep. can use these same tricks like for example, how the filter is actually defined there on the lower left of the analyzer and also dragging and dropping and, and adding filters together. Some of these tricks to build your own filters and not get too wound up in the syntax. Chris, the big question is, this is fantastic, but where can I learn more? And I know you've got an amazing YouTube channel, so perhaps you can take us to your YouTube channel and tell us where we can start. Like, is there a playlist that you, you've mentioned one or two, I think. You know, if I want to learn more, which playlist should I start with on your channel and, you know, take us down that road? Thanks, David, for sure. And invite everybody to check out my YouTube channel. So let's go ahead and uh, take a peek. Uh, here it is. So just either search Chris Greer, search Wireshark, search, I just did Greer Chris just because I'm signed out here on this browser. Uh, Wireshark TCP. 
there's hopefully a lot of ways, and we can link it below. Uh, but here you can see this is what it's about. So about making Wireshark more digestible and easier to use. Because look, I don't forget how daunting it was. I remember. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done is put together, uh, basically it's a TCP, not just TCP, but it's a Wireshark Masterclass. So if you come down here, this playlist, Wireshark Masterclass, it takes you through nine lessons of the most common things that you need in order to be effective with Wireshark. If you're studying for a cybersecurity cert, if you're looking for joining a CTF and there's going to be some common stuff, most of what you're going to need is in that Masterclass. Apart from that, you can see, oh, there's this guy here this guy that I've talked to before, um, <laughs> spyware analysis, malware analysis, tips about TCP, how TCP actually works, uh, some of the strange things that you see within Wireshark itself, MTU versus MSS, lots of different uh, hands-on stuff. And I will say that a lot of my videos, I give you the PCAP so you can follow along and you can actually do something while I'm walking you through it. That's brilliant. Just for everyone who's watching, please go and sub to Chris's channel. Please go and show the love. Chris is sharing his years and years of knowledge with all of us and making it freely available. So please go and show your love and subscribe to his channel. Chris, as always, really want to thank you for sharing and um, look forward to our next one. Thanks for having me back, David. I hope that's soon.